So over the last uh, five or seven years, we've started to develop tools that are really uh, transforming how we do our work out here. One of those are um, Argo profiling floats. These are small uh, cylinders that measure temperature and salinity as a function of depth in the ocean. We can toss those over the side and they can change the buoyancy so they can either float or sink. And they drift for the ocean currents about a kilometer below the surface. And every 10 days they pop up to the surface, measures temperature and salinity as they rise send that data back to us by satellite. And uh, there are about 3,000 of those floats now around the, the world ocean. And in a real sense, it's the first time we're measuring the ocean beneath the sea surface. Uh, and in particular, in places like the Southern Ocean, where shipping has always uh, been scarce because it's a horrible place to be in a ship most of the time. So it's the strongest winds and the biggest waves anywhere you can find in the ocean. And there's very little uh, merchant shipping down here. So we've, we've always suffered from a lack of data in the Southern Ocean. These floats are allowing us to really measure the ocean for the first time in remote regions like this. And the third big one is uh, satellites. So about 20 years ago, we started launching satellites that can measure a whole variety of uh, properties of the ocean from space. The most powerful one for us is uh, physical oceanographers who study ocean currents are satellite altimeters that can measure the height of the sea surface to within a few millimeters. And this is the height of the surface if you smoothed out all the waves. And uh, so when there, wherever there's an ocean current in the, uh, in the ocean, there's also a slope to the sea surface. So the sea surface sits about a meter and a half higher south of Tasmania than it does against the coast of Antarctica. And we can measure that, those slopes of the sea surface really precisely with satellite uh, measurements now. And that combination of satellites looking down from above and Argo floats profiling from below is really a, um, transformed how we do our work in the last five or seven years. And so what's this, what's this water out here? What, what's, what's behind you right now? Yeah, so right now we're sitting at about 57 degrees, 24 minutes south. So we're about two thirds of the way from uh, Australia down to Antarctica. And we're right on the southern edge of this massive current, the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. The current itself is made up of a series of streams or filaments that wiggle back and forth and look uh, kind of a turbulent uh, form, eddies and meanders and um, a sort of complex pattern. We're right on the edge of one of those uh, streams of flow right now. So the, an instrument in the hull that sends sound pulses down in the ocean is saying that there's a, about a 25 centimeter per second current to the south right here. So that's about half a knot uh, to the south. The currents down here are not so strong compared to, say, strong tidal currents that people might be familiar with around the coast of uh, Australia. But they're deep. They extend down to, right to the sea floor, four or five kilometers below the surface. And they're reasonably broad, maybe 50 or 100 kilometers across each one of these streams. So we're, uh, the band we're on right now is called the Southern Antarctic Circumpolar Current Front, technically speaking. But each one of these, uh, these current jets is a boundary between warmer water to the north and colder water to the south. So at the moment, the sea surface uh, temperature is about three and a half degrees. Air temperature is about two degrees. And uh, as we make our way north up to Frio, uh, we'll see the temperature rise to about um, 16 or 18 degrees. And it'll, we'll do that in a series of jumps or steps rapid changes of temperature over a short distance. And each one of those will be one of those uh, current streams that make up the circumpolar current. I think the, um, personally, I probably swing back and forth a bit myself. Um, in terms of the science, in terms of sorting out what's happening with the, uh, with the climate system and, and what the impacts of change are going to be, we've made really dramatic progress really in the last five or 10 years. And so that's, that's a positive. It means that at least we know what we're doing and we, uh, we know what the impacts of that are going to be. So we know what we have a better idea of what to expect 
if we do or don't act. A lot of the, uh, the real action in the climate uh, change issue at the moment is in some ways moving beyond the science. It's, it's a social, political, um, moral, ethical, economic uh, problem that's a major challenge for us. And the decisions we need to make need to take the best science into account, but there are many more aspects to it that need to be thought about. And uh, to me, probably the most sobering thing is that probably the greatest impacts of climate change will happen to those who are least, uh, have the least capacity to respond to it. In the sense of, uh, I think it'll hit the poor more than it will hit the rich, and that'll happen most uh, between nations and within nations. And so there is a moral and ethical dimension to, uh, to the climate change issue. As scientists, it's not really my role to comment on that. I'm not an expert in that area. But what our role is, to, is uh, what our role is, is to provide the best scientific knowledge we can so that people can make those tough decisions and avoid the worst consequences of climate change and adapt to the changes that we can't avoid. All right. No worries. You know where to find me if you decide you want to. <laughs> you know where to find me if you uh, decide something didn't come out right. Or I'll go and check it. I recommend coming right. I'd still like to get this stuff.